Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, for the third and final webinar in our Web Scraping for Social Science Research uh, series. Um, again, I hope everybody is well under the um, current circumstances. Uh, your time is very much appreciated. Uh, and if, if this is your second or third time uh, joining us on this webinar series, uh, you're very welcome uh, as well. Uh, so today it's the, the final um, webinar in our web scraping series. Um, we showed a case study uh, where we showed the value uh, and the role um, data scraped from a web page uh, played in a social science research project. Last week we looked at how you could use Python um, to collect data that's stored on a web page. So the text and the images and the links and the files that you see on a web page, how can you request those using Python and how can you convert them uh, into usable uh, data? Our final task today is to look at um, something called an application programming interface uh, or an API, uh, which is another uh, method of getting data uh, from the web. Uh, just quickly, this um, webinar series is part of a wider new forms of data training series that we've got here at the UK Data Service. Um, so on the 12th of May, we've got a webinar uh, with myself and my colleague, Julia Kazmaier, um, looking at the five key skills and knowledge domains uh, that are related to being a computational social scientist. So much like today's webinar and previous ones, there's a mix of, of theory and, and demonstrating code uh, that you will uh, that you can use um, in your computational social science activities. We're also doing something somewhat novel. Uh, over the month of May, we're doing these live coding demonstrations, and you can see some of the links uh, there, and I'll post them uh, in the question box uh, as well uh, near the end of this webinar. These will be roughly half hour um, explicit coding demonstrations, um, somewhat like we, we'll do today, but we'll focus entirely on code, talk through what, what we're doing line by line. Um, so hopefully you can join us uh, for those as well. And we've got past webinars. Um, you can view those on our YouTube channel uh, and all the materials are available uh, online as well. So today we're going to cover uh, these kind of six key uh, areas. So we're going to ask ourselves, uh, what is an API? Um, we're going to do a demonstration of how you actually interact uh, with an API using Python. Um, we'll reflect on the value of this approach or method uh, to social science research and of course must consider the limitations and the ethical implications uh, as well and we'll take your questions near the end but feel free to post them right the way throughout the webinar uh, and we'll cover them at the end and I'll again post you to some uh, learning uh, and teaching resources uh, and you've, some of you have probably received those uh, already from us in advance uh, as well. So what is uh, an API? Because it might be a, an unhelpful um, acronym. So officially, uh, an application programming interface is a set of functions and procedures um, that allow the creation um, and that access the features or data of an operating system, application, or other service. It's quite a technical description. In essence, an API acts as an intermediary between two uh, or more software applications. So let's take a fairly simple real life example. Let's say we have two individuals. One is an English speaker and one is an Italian speaker. And let's say the English speaker doesn't even know what buongiorno actually means. They have no knowledge of Italian whatsoever. And the Italian speaker has absolutely no knowledge of English whatsoever. How can these two individuals communicate? Well, if they're lucky, uh, they may have a real-life uh, translator. Of course, there are technological solutions as well. So these two individuals do not need to uh, know how to converse with each other. They just need to know how to communicate what they want to say to a translator who does the heavy lifting and then translates uh, for the other individual. And an API performs a very similar uh, role. So let's say we have a program. Um, Let's call it a smartphone application, and this application needs real-time traffic data, um, let's say from Transport Scotland. So Transport Scotland may have a database containing real-time real and historical traffic information. Now, one way of getting that data is the smartphone application can go directly to the online database. The trouble with that approach is that the program needs to know a lot of technical information about the database. 
needs to know what language it's built in, it needs to know how to ask for information. A much simpler approach is to place an intermediary between these two applications called an API. So the program can just say, okay, API, give me data. The API then does the translating, it does the heavy lifting, and communicates that in a much simpler way to the database. We need some data. In response, the database doesn't have to go back to the program. It returns to the API uh, a response. The API takes that response and again transfers it back to the program. So an API just sits in the middle of, of computer applications or software applications uh, and it performs the same role as a translator. Um, so it's a very powerful uh, way of ensuring software applications can communicate uh, with each other. So now that we know how they uh, work in some uh, shape or form, why would we collect data? So as social scientists, you know, what's the value uh, of an API? So first and foremost, they tend to be just an important source of publicly available uh, information on social phenomena um, of interest. Uh, in some cases, um, let's say the UK government has an online uh, data portal. So there's uh, weekly or monthly uh, data releases uh, of some data sets from the Department for Transport, Department for Health, um, etc. If you're interested in that data, then you need to go to that website um, you know, right click, download the data manually, um, etc. Often what happens is an organization will just say, okay, instead of releasing the data on a weekly basis or a monthly basis uh, in, in the form of files, what they will do is say, right, you can have access to our online database, but only through an API. So if you can communicate with the API, you can send requests for data that we hold and those requests can be customizable and flexible. Those requests can be scheduled using a programming language. They can be every day, every half day, every week, um, et cetera. So that's a really key point, that APIs allow customized access to data resources. So think traditionally, if you wanted data from a government department, for example, you might download the entire uh, procurement uh, data for a given department. So every you know, spend over £5,000 that the Department for Health made in 2020, for example. But you might be only interested in certain amounts of uh, spending, so you might be only interested in purchases that were over £100,000. You might only be interested in purchases made in Scotland or in Wales, for example. So instead of downloading this big bulky file and then doing the filtering yourself, when you actually communicate with the API, you can just get the data you need. So you can just send a customized request uh, for data. And then once the data um, are sent back to you by the API, they might come in a format that you're not very familiar with. So they might come in a hierarchical um, data format. And we'll see some examples um, today. But it is possible then to reshape uh, those formats into something more familiar. So like a traditional rows and columns type um, data structure, uh, which we would call a variable by case matrix, or a tabular um, data structure, which again can then be linked to social science data that you're interested in um, also. So there's a logic to using an API. So you can communicate with an API using multiple programming languages. You can do it through R, you can do it through PHP, you can do it through Perl. Lots of programming languages allow you to communicate with APIs. But there's an underpinning logic um, that apply to the process no matter what language um, you're using. So the first thing you need to know is the location of the API. So this is its web address. So this is very similar to the web address of any website. So the UK data service website will look like something HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash UK data service dot AC dot UK. So APIs are also located at the end of web addresses. So for example, the UK police API, which provides open data about street level crimes, the and number of forces that there are in the UK, neighborhood level crime statistics, that can be accessed at the following web address, uh, https data.police.uk forward slash API. So once we know where the API can be accessed, then we need to know how we're allowed to use the API. So for example, the UK police uh, API doesn't require you to register your use of the API, 
you don't need to tell that API anything about yourself, you don't need to provide an email address, um, etc. But it does restrict the number of requests for data that you can make, and it's around 15 per second, which is obviously a lot, but you need to think a bit more computationally about um, programs that might be looking for data multiple times every couple of seconds or even every second. And this number of allowable requests is known as the rate limit. So it's the rate at which you can request data uh, from the API. And the third piece of knowledge we need to get going um, is the location of the data of interest. So the API exists at a web address and so do the data resources. So again, at the UK Police API, we can get street level crime data at https police.uk forward slash API crimes hyphen street and the location of data on an API is known as its endpoint so it's the end of the web address that then uh, gives you back your data so thankfully you know if you joined us um, last week you'll see that it's very similar to scraping a website you need to request the web page itself uh, and then you can start working uh, with the data and now that we know these uh, pieces of information then we can actually uh, implement the interaction with the API. So once we have the information, the first thing we need to do is register your use of the API. Again, only if required. Most APIs will require you to register. Um, there's usually no cost. There's almost always a free version uh, of an API, but you do need to provide some information. So it might be your name, an email address, it might be a link to your website, um, and they usually ask you to write a short description um, of the application that you're planning to use the API for. So if you're a mobile developer, you'll say, well, I'm building a smart application that takes police data, visualizes it, and you know provides users with some kind of service or paid for uh, service. Even us as researchers, we're still using the API. We might be creating an application, but we are writing code that requests the data. So we might need to um, communicate that to uh, the API. So once we've done all that, we can get into the kind of meat and drink uh, of interacting with an API. So we actually request uh, the data. And then we might need to supply authentication. So if we do need to register our use of the API, um, what we're granted is a unique ID, essentially. And every time we request data, we provide the unique ID. Uh, otherwise, the request uh, won't work. So this uh, entire process is known as making a call uh, to the API. And the final thing we can do is get the data and then save it to a file uh, for future um, use. Now let's look at an API in practice. So let's say we're interested in COVID-19 um, data. Um, so we might be interested in the discourse around the disease. We might be interested in the levels of public information that are available about the, the disease. Um, so we might be interested in one of these uh, large-scale national newspapers. Uh, so the Guardian is, is one. Um, you can see that it provides information on the website uh, itself. So here's a subsection about the coronavirus explained. There's a section as it relates to the UK. There's a global section. There's an opinion section, um, etc probably doesn't need to be said, but I will then contradict myself and say it anyway. You could manually collect uh, information. So if we were interested in this particular article, um, we could you know, highlight what we want. We could right click, we could copy, we could open a TXT file, we could save it, um, etc. But it's obviously not something we can do at scale. So thankfully, The Guardian um, has foreseen that its information would be very useful to a wide range of people. And so they've built an API. So they've got an online database that stores all the information about its articles, including the text, the images, the videos, the links to other articles, etc. And it makes most of that available uh, through its um, API. In some cases, the API will allow you to explore the data without having to write any programming code and without having to uh, register your use. So for example, the Guardian allows you to explore what kind of data is available. And so it creates a little user interface. Uh, let's say, for example, um, we'll type in Scotland, because that's where I'm currently living. 
Uh, we can tell it to search its content um, database. So let's run it again. Yeah, so we can see it returns um, some information. So here's the web address uh, that we've submitted to the API. So we've got a base URL here, and then we've got the query um, that we were interested in. So go to the API and then look for mentions of Scotland. So we can see we get a total of 102,000 results um, relating to Scotland. Uh, there are 10 results per page. There's over 10,000 pages of results. Uh, and then in a field called results uh, here, we can see the actual content of what we're interested in. So the first article uh, was written in March 2020 on the 17th. Um, the article is available at this web address here. Um, we can take a look, see if that works. Yes, it does. So uh, we can read the article if that's what we're interested in. And it's found a second one about poetry, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this is quite useful just for getting used to the API, but it's, again, very difficult to uh, interact with this user interface uh, at scale or at pace uh, over time, uh, et cetera. So we do need to write some uh, programming code uh, that helps us access uh, this information. So what information do we need? So we're working through our steps. So we know where the API is uh, located. Um, it's located at something called HTTPS contents.guardianapis.com. So we know where that exists. Um, we can actually test out if you want to see what needing authentication does. Um, so we know there's a URL or a web address where we can access data. If we try and do it, uh, you can actually see that it tells us we haven't provided our API key. So we haven't given the API our unique identification, therefore it won't return us um, any information. But at least we know that this is the correct web address for accessing uh, the API. So if we know where to get the API, we need to figure out how we can use it. So we need to know the uh, terms of use. Um, we can see the terms of use uh, at a different um, web page. So how do we access the API? Well, there's two levels of access. Uh, there's a developer, which is free, uh, and there's a commercial um, license as well that we can uh, use. So with the free uh, level of access is what we're interested in. We can make up to 12 calls per second. So we can request data 12 times per second, up to a maximum of 5,000 um, per day. The content that we can access is strictly related to the article text uh, in comparison to the commercial access, which gives us images and audio and video. So if that's the focus of your research, you may need to think about building in the cost um, of a commercial key. And you can see we, with the free uh, level of access, we have up to about 2 million pieces of content, um, but there's more. So if you pay for the service, you can get access to pretty much, I'm guessing, everything The Guardian has published. Um, that's digitally uh, available. So now we know where the API uh, exists. We know its web address. We know how to use it. Um, in advance of this, I've registered uh, use uh, of the API, so we don't need to uh, do that now. The final thing is just to think about, well, what types of data are available uh, through the API? And helpfully, the Guardian documentation is very good, so we can see which endpoints or which uh, data tables were allowed access. So there's one called content, uh, one called tags, one called sections, one called additions, and one called um, single items. And we'll go through what some of these uh, mean uh, during our demonstration. Uh, but in essence, your know, content allows us to retrieve uh, a list of search results, tags, um, tell us which kind of bits of metadata an article is tagged with. So if an article is about the environment, it might have an environment tag. Sections tells us which part of the newspaper it's published in, editions which edition, uh, and single item gives us every single bit of information The Guardian has about one particular article, which is obviously very important. Um, and we're gonna show an example uh, of that um, as well. Um, I'll just demonstrate it myself very quickly, just so you can see uh, how it should work. Um, basically, you don't need to install anything uh, on your machine to be able to run the code. Um, it all launches on a service called um, Binder, um, which is a, an open source 
computing environment um, platforms. You might see a screen like this. Uh, it might take uh, a wee while um, to launch, um, but I'll show you the final result, uh, what it looks like. Perfect. So you should now be able to see um, what's called a Jupyter Notebook, which is what we're using um, for the coding demonstrations. Again, um, if you want to just give me a quick yes, just to say that you can see uh, the notebook, just in case um, you're still seeing the other screen. Perfect, thanks very much. Okay, so let's get stuck into the uh, demonstration. So this is a, a Jupyter Notebook. Um, it mixes um, text, uh, code, uh, and output um, in a single um, document. Um, so you can uh, work through this uh, once this um, webinar is finished, um, but I'm just going to enter a slideshow uh, mode, um, and I'll work through our example of interacting with the Guardian um, website. So if you are working alongside um, me as I'm doing this, all you need to do are uh, run or execute the code that's contained in um, a cell that's identified by an IN and some square um, brackets. So for example, this is one of the, the coding uh, blocks that we've got, so I can execute that. Python asks me for some information, uh, and yes, I will enjoy it, hopefully. Perfect. So Jupyter Notebooks, if you're interested in, they're a really powerful um, data science uh, tool. Um, I've got some links in the notebook. Um, there's a great guy at University of Liverpool and um, has some excellent resources um, as well. And again, don't worry if you can't see the notebook now. I've posted the link and we'll email everyone at the end of this with the links again so you'll be able to uh, work through if you can't do it um, just now. So we have our three pieces of information. We know where the API exists. Uh, we know the terms of use, how many um, calls we're allowed to make and we know the different endpoints containing data that we're interested in. So the first thing we need to do is load in our API key so we can make requests. Um, so I've stored my API key uh, in a folder uh, called auth, A-U-T-H, and I've stored it in a file called guardian API text, uh, key.text. And this is good practice in general. Your API key is unique to you, so if you give it away other people can use the API um, as if they were you, and that might pose problems. So it's usually good to keep it in a text file. Um, but for you, I'm quite trusting, so you can use my key um, for a couple of days. So I'm going to open that file. I'm going to read in what's contained in the file, and I'm just going to show you very quickly what an API key uh, looks like. So it's just a unique um, scrambling of, of letters and numbers um, that allow us to interact with the API. So good, we've got our unique identification. Let's now focus on getting uh, information that we're interested uh, in. So we're interested in articles about COVID-19. The first thing we need to do is just tell Python uh, which functionality and which modules we need for interacting with the API. So we need a module for working with our operating system. As we saw previously, that allows us to look inside folders, it allows us to create new files. Um, so that's the OS module. If you joined us last week, you'll remember the requests module, so that goes and fetches web addresses for us and returns the content. Uh, we've got a JSON module, which is for working with the data that's returned um, by API APIs. Um, let's see if I can make this a little bit bigger, if that helps. And there's a date time um, module as well, which allows us to do things with dates and times, uh, which is quite useful um, also. And I've just printed a little message uh, to myself saying, um, okay, everything's been imported um, successfully. Right, so now let's look uh, through the Guardian API uh, for mentions of COVID-19. Uh, so the first thing we do is we define the base URL. Now I can call that anything I want, it's just a variable um, name. Uh, and you'll have seen that before. So this is where the API is found um, at the end of HTTP, etc., cetera, um, and at the end of the search endpoint. So that relates to the content that we were looking at earlier, the content endpoint. We define a search term that we're interested in, so it's just a simple bit of text, COVID-19. I need to provide authentication to the API when I use it, um, so I just create a variable that has one field 
and in that field uh, is my API key um, itself. Because remember, I loaded that in earlier and stored it in a variable called this. So then what I need to do is I need to construct the uh, web address. So the web address is made up of the base URL. Um, then it's built up of a query um, symbol. So I'm saying, right, take the base URL, and then on that, start looking for this search term. And then I'll just print that web address just so you can actually see what it looks like um, itself. Then what I do is I've got the web address. Uh, now I want to fetch it um, from the Guardian API. So we use the get method from the requests module and we tell it to go fetch the web address and we provide the authentication uh, in a variable called headers. Um, that's a, and this is very standard, very common way of doing it. You won't need to, um, you know, make this up yourself, you know, this is standard code for doing this task. And then at the end, what I want to say is, okay, I've stored the results of the request in a variable called response, and I basically want to check if the request was um, successful. So we get some results uh, that look like this and that are encouraging, which is good. Uh, note that this is a live demonstration, so um, I do need to be connected to the internet, and it's working so far. So you can see the web address where we've requested uh, information from. And um, again, if I was to type this into my URL, this wouldn't into my web browser. Apologies, this wouldn't work because I need to provide um, authentication. Thankfully, the way I've requested it from the API, um, it's returned 200 code, meaning that was a successful request. So. I formulated my request correctly, and it's been sent back to me uh, by the uh, API. Just to show that it doesn't really matter what you call um, your variables, I'll just do the exact same task really quickly, except I'll change base URL to Highlander, I'll change the variable storing the search term to Yarl, etc., etc. I'll make a call to the API, and you can see I'm getting the exact same result, which is really good. Um, so up to a certain point, you can call your variables what you want uh, in Python. Um, and as a little quiz, if you can tell me which brewery these beers refer to in the question box, then um, you'll win the uh, prize. So you may be uh, wondering what exactly it is we requested. Um, so with the response, we can see in the previous example, um, the response has an attribute called the status code. Um, it also has an attribute uh, called dot JSON. So that's basically the data itself that's associated with the response. So we take this uh, JSON response and we store it in a variable called data and then we actually take a look um, at the data itself. So we can see what the API returns to us. Um, it returns this kind of odd hierarchical um, set of data uh, it seems to be made up of fields, and each field then seems to have a value, but certain fields, so the response field seems to be made up of other fields, etc. We'll look at ways of interacting uh, or of navigating this data structure, but for now we can just visually inspect it, and we can pick out metadata. So we can see that there are a total of nearly 16,000 results associated uh, with our search. We can see that we get 10 results per page, and there's about 1,600 pages of results relating to our search term, COVID-19. Uh, and the actual data itself uh, that's associated with the request is helpfully contained in a field called results. So you can see the results field then has a long list of articles um, about uh, our search term. So the first one we found is an article called what is COVID-19, helpfully. Um, its web address is here. So if we wanted to read that article, we could type that into our web browser. And this article exists on the API at this address here. And we'll use this address in a moment as well um, to request the actual article text itself. So visually, we can inspect um, the data that's returned. But as you can tell, it's hierarchical. We're not entirely sure. Um, how we can actually navigate it. Should we just do control F and should we just look for certain words? So if I'm looking for the word web, you can see that this is not a very efficient way of, of navigating uh, the results. 
Um, so thankfully, there's ways of navigating these types of um, variables. So we asked for the response to return the data in something called a JSON data structure. Um, this is known as a dictionary in Python. It's just a type of variable um, that has certain ways of interacting with it. So the first thing we should notice is that a dictionary is made up of keys uh, and values. So it's made up of pairs of keys uh, and values. So the first thing we should do is, well, what keys are actually contained um, in the dictionary? So we can use the dot keys method and it will give us a list of the keys. And um, somewhat confusingly, the result says there's only one field in the data that we um, that was returned to us. Um, that's obviously not true because as we visually inspected, we can see that it's a hierarchical um, data structure. So this is the top level key, but within this key is a list of other keys. And then within these keys are other keys again. So there's a hierarchical nested nature um, to a JSON or a dictionary uh, variable. So let's look inside. So if we want to look at what a key um, uh, contains, we write the variable storing all the data, and then we use square brackets, uh, quotation marks, and then the name of the key. So this will tell us which keys exist within the um, response key. And now it's starting to make sense with what we visually um, could see ourselves. There are uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine keys within the response key. Um, and the main one we're interested in is the uh, results uh, key as well. So the results key contains a list of all the articles that relate to our search. So we need to navigate that list as well uh, in Python. So the first thing we'll do is we'll take what's stored in the results key and we'll put it in a new variable called search results. Uh, and then we'll take a quick look uh, within uh, that variable. So now you can see we've stripped out all the other keys at the higher level. So we no longer see the response key, the total results key, etc. Now we just have a list um, of observations for all the articles uh, that relate to COVID-19. So the first one is here, what is COVID-19? If we scroll down, um, there's another one about pregnancy. If we scroll down further, uh, etc., we can see all the different articles um, up to 10, because there's only 10 um, results uh, per page. So we have a list of results. Uh, it's probably useful to confirm that we're working uh, with a list. So in Python, for any variable, you can ask Python to tell you what type it is. That seems a kind of obvious thing to do. Um, but even though you might have something um, whose value is a number, if it's actually stored as a string, if a number is stored as a piece of text, you can't do any calculations with it, for example. Or if something is stored as a list, there's a certain set of functions that you can apply to that variable that don't exist um, for other variable types. So we can ask Python, great, we're working with a list. Now that we know that, well, you can say, how long is the list? So how many articles uh, did we find? I told you there were 10. Uh, that was based on a visual inspection and on part of the metadata as well. But we can ask Python to confirm. So how long is the list? Uh, it's 10 elements um, long. And then we might be interested in looking within the list uh, as well. So we can say for every result uh, in the list that we've created, uh, print certain types of information. So for each article, tell me what type it is, tell me what section it appeared in, and tell me when it was um, published. And I'll just zoom out a wee bit. And you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So all the ten articles that we found, um, we look at their type, so we know their articles. Uh, the first article appeared in World News. The third article appeared in the Environment section. Uh, this was published in April. This was published in March, um, etc. So you're already seeing ways we can use Python to uh, work our way through and what look like fairly complicated and um, hierarchical data uh, structures. So before we move on to the slightly more complicated um, examples, um, we can actually say, right, that's a pretty good bit of work. I'm interested in those 10 articles. Um, how do we actually uh, save them? So we mentioned that the data is stored in something called a JSON uh, data structure. That's also a file type. So we want to write that information to a JSON file. So it's really easy uh, to do. First, all we're going to do is create a folder 
uh, called downloads and um, if that folder already exists which it should on my machine it just says look unable to create it and um, it already exists uh, which it does so that little try accept close is quite good for catching um, errors as you can see zoom in a bit more for you uh, out a little bit perfect so we want to save the results to a JSON file the first thing I'm going to do really simply is I'm just going to grab today's date and I'm going to format it as year month and date and then I'll print that so you can see it I'm going to define a file uh, for storing the uh, scraped results and um, so I'm going to put it in the downloads folder and then I'm going to call it guardian API COVID-19 search uh, and I'm going to add today's date to the file name uh, and it's going to be a JSON file as well so what I do is with Python I say with this file open in write mode and um, dump the JSON data into this file so you can see the kind of um, logic of what we're doing uh, as well so with this step, all I asked Python to return to me uh, is today's date, and you can see this um, here. But how do we know that the actual uh, save uh, function worked? I'm on my machine at the moment. I could obviously just open up the folder, um, but I can actually use Python to navigate my machine and say, does this file um, exist? So I can check whether the file was created, and B, I can check if the actual file contains the information uh, we collected. So the first thing I'm asking Python is list all the contents of the downloads folder. So you can see that, okay, when I tried to save the file, it definitely created a file. So I know the file exists, which is really good. Now I need to confirm that there's actually something in the file. So very similar to saving it, we open the file, but this time in read mode. So we want to read in its contents and instead of using JSON uh, dot dump we're using json dot load um, which is just the uh, antonym of what we were doing uh, and then I ask Python to spit out the data uh, so you can see uh, that worked so I had a variable before uh, response dot json um, and now I've saved that to a file I've loaded it back in and here we can see the first uh, 10 articles and uh, that we downloaded from the API so phew uh, we have successfully requested data using an API. Hopefully you'll agree with me that the requesting is actually relatively simple. It's just about constructing the web address um, correctly and the uh, API documentation usually tells you how to do that. The tricky bit is working with the downloaded data. It comes back in JSON or it comes back in something called XML, which are hierarchical nested data structures and it can be difficult to pick out the elements that you're interested um, in. So before we uh, go back to thinking about the value and the limitations and the ethical concerns, let's do a couple of more demonstrations. So let's refine what we're doing. Um, and we'll do four more uh, things. So we'll include additional search terms because we've only used one. We'll deal with the fact that there are multiple pages of results. So if there are 15,000 articles, I want all 15,000. You know, this is the year of big data. I don't think a sample of 10 is um, representative. The third thing is I'm going to actually then grab the article text itself. Um, so we saw a list of articles in our search results. For each of those we want to then collect the article text and we'll see how to do that. Um, and then hypothetically we'll see how to handle the rate limit. Very unlikely we'll bump up against the 5,000 um, daily limit. Um, but it is possible um, and you can think of testing your code if you're constantly testing and then you think oh okay now it works maybe you've actually used all your calls to the API uh, that has happened uh, to me before so let's get some preliminaries I'm just confirming that you know we have all the modules loaded in I've got today's date and I've got my API key and um, we've seen how to do that I'll just confirm uh, that Python has all of the information it needs um, so I won't uh, go through too much uh, what's happening um, here. Okay, so let's include some additional search terms. So we can use what are called logical operators. So and, or, not, and, not. Um, there's lots of combinations of those operators uh, to include additional search terms. So we've seen this previously. Uh, previously. We've got a base URL uh, that we're using again. But this time I'm adding 
an extra search term, so coronavirus, um, and I'm adding in the logical operator uh, OR into that search term. I'm providing my API key um, again. I'm building the web address. It's composed of the base URL plus a query term and plus the search terms. Then I'm again requesting that web address and I'm just checking if it was a successful um, request. So you can see the uh, web address that I've requested. Uh, don't worry about the fact that there's a space. Um, that actually needs to be there. Um, if I did this, uh, Python reads that as one string, so it doesn't see the, the logical operator. It just sees one search term, which is COVID-19 or coronavirus, which is a silly uh, term. So when you actually request the web address, the API knows how to handle this space here. And again, we get a 200 status code, uh, which is good. That means my request uh, was valid. So what I want to check is, now that I've added an extra search term, do I get more search results than I did for just searching um, for one? So again, I take the data uh, that's returned to us in JSON, I put it into a data variable. Again, this could be called anything uh, you want. And then there's a key in that data variable called total, which tells me how many search results uh, there are. So now you can see if I add an extra search term, there are now 20,000 articles um, that are relevant uh, for my analysis. And in the notebook itself, when you get to work through it, um, you'll see I've given you an exercise of, of adding different search terms in different combinations. So you might say, I want an article that mentions COVID-19 and England, for example, uh, and you can see the results uh, of that. So we do get a higher number of results than if we just searched for COVID um, on its own. So how do we deal with multiple pages of results? So the first thing to understand is, um, just because you're allowed to request lots of data from an API, doesn't mean it gives you back all of that data in one go. Um, basically, an API, it takes a lot of computational resources to operate an API. If every time someone made a request, the API returned everything, it would soon be overwhelmed. So basically, it gives me the full list. It says, right, that request is associated with 20,000 articles, but I'm just going to give you them 10 at a time. And you have to request each individual page of results um, one at a time uh, yourself. So it transfers the work back to you basically to make more requests. But thankfully, it's a very simple um, process. So there's two ways of tackling this issue. Um, we can increase the number of results returned per page, uh, and then we can request each individual page um, of results. So the first thing we'll do is tell the API we want 50 results per page, not 10, because uh, that's too few. So these three lines are the exact same um, as before. Uh, define the base URL, the search terms, the authentication. This time, I'm defining a variable called num results. Um, that could be num pages, num whatever. You can call it what you want. Uh, and I'm setting it to the maximum that the API allows. Uh, and I got that information um, from the documentation. I build a web address. Uh, it's the same as before. But now there's an extra bit where I say, right, filter by and um, page size equals uh, 50. Again, I'll show you what that web address looks like, and we'll ask uh, Python to tell us whether it's a successful result. Excellent, another successful result. And this time you can see the web address uh, is slightly longer because it has this filtering option here. So it seems to have worked. Uh, can we just confirm that we now have 50 results uh, per page? So again, transfer the data into a variable and then look at the page size key uh, to see what its value is. Uh, and correct, yes, it's given us 50 uh, results um, per page. So now we know we have 50 per results per page. That still gives us about, well, I'm not sure. It's going to be hundreds of pages. So how many pages do we actually need to request to get the full complement of search results? Well, there's a pages um, key uh, that's returned to us by the response. That tells us how many pages of results uh, there are. What I do is I add the value one to that um, result, and we'll just print it to the um, console. So we can see that there are 402 um, web pages we need to request. Now you're probably thinking that seems silly because if I cancel this out, you can see that the API said that there are 401 pages 
Um, but Python has a little quirk that means we need to add one to it. And basically that quirk is to do with the way Python loops um, over a range of numbers. So the code that I'm just about to show you starts at the number one and goes up to but not including the number five. So for the numbers one to five, print the number. You can see it only goes as far as the number four. So this may be just, um, just the way we read English or maybe it's a cultural thing, but if I see in range one to five, I expect that to go up to and include the number five. In Python, it doesn't. Um, so now you can see why um, we have to add one uh, to the total number of pages. Because um, when we run the loop, we have to say go from one up as far as 402, and that means the Python goes from page one to page one on, uh, to page 401. Uh, we'll be here till tomorrow if we try and request 401 pages. Um, so let's just request the first 20 just to see um, if it works. So again, we've got largely the same web address. We've got a base URL, the search terms, the page size, uh, except this time we have an extra filter, which is the specific page number we're interested um, in. And again, I'll print the web address so you can see. We do all the same things. We request that web address. We store the result in a variable called data. Uh, and then for each page, we define a file uh, name, um, and we're going to uh, save the information we download to that file. So now you can see the list of web addresses uh, that we're requesting. Uh, so you can see that it requested 20 web pages, uh, so page one, page two, uh, et cetera, all the way down to um, page 20. Again, how can we confirm uh, if this actually worked? Well, we can ask Python to list all the contents uh, of the downloads folder uh, and hip hip hooray, it did work. Um, for each page of results, uh, it saved uh, each page uh, in a file called page one, page two, uh, et cetera. So that's a way of um, handling multiple pages of results. It's a, in essence, it's figuring out how many pages there are and then requesting each individual page um, itself. So let's get to the, the really crucial thing, which is that's all interesting, but where's the actual article text itself? I want to do some content analysis, some sentiment, sentiment analysis, some uh, natural language processing, whatever you want to do, you need the actual article text um, itself. So what we do is we take our search results and then we use a different endpoint uh, on the API that gives us the article text um, itself. So we have a list of search results. Let's pull one of those articles out, uh, not quite at random, um, from that list. So we create a variable called search results, uh, which stores all of the values contained within the results uh, key. And then I pull out one article um, from the list of results. So basically what I've done is I've just taken one article um, and how I've done that is I've referred uh, to the element in the list by which position it's in. So in Python, uh, this approach is called indexing and an index begins at zero. If you've used R, for example, uh, indexing begins at one. So the first element in a list is in position one second element is in position two. Now that's in R. In Python, slightly more confusingly, the first element in a list is in position zero, the second element is in position one, the third in position two, etc. So just to test that out, we know we have 50 results per page. So basically there are between zero and 49 uh, different positions in the list. Let's say I want article, uh, so this is article 31, because remember it begins at zero. Uh, and yet you can see that's a different article that's given to me. So um, whether we can learn something from Germany, uh, what's the article in position six? Uh, yeah, uh, a different article. Um, so when you have uh, a list, you can refer to it by its position in the list. But let's go back to article zero, um, something about, uh, coronavirus latest 30th of March at a glance. So let's go and get the actual text of that article um, using uh, Python. So what we do is we go to the article uh, and we take out the value that's stored in the API 
um, URL key. Very quickly, just to show you what that is, uh, there's a field called API URL, uh, and again, this is the web address for that specific article. So we want to request that web address. So again, we build up a web address, it consists of a base URL, and then it's got a little search function, uh, and we're looking for the body of that article. So we're looking for the text of that article. And again, how did I know what to say here and here? It's all in the documentation. Um, it's not something you need to figure out yourself. Good, so it tells me I've successfully requested the article. Now you're starting to see the same process again. Um, what does the article look like? Again, it's got some metadata. There's only one article um, with this ID. It's in the world section, it was published then, etc. But now we can see there's a field key and within that key is one called body and then the value of that key is the actual text of the article um, itself. So we can kind of expand it here, you can see the full uh, text. Let's just actually pull out the text itself and store it in a separate um, uh, variable. Uh, we can just get a better look uh, at that as well. So we can see that it's mainly um, English, but there's lots of funny little uh, symbols uh, mixed in. Basically because the article was published on the web, the article is in a sense a web page, and so it's written in a language called HTML, a Hypertext Transfer Markup Language, um, meaning we need a way of stripping out all of these A's and P's and H2 tags so that we can read the text um, itself. If you joined us last week, uh, you'll know how to do that. Um, I'll do a quick demonstration here. So we need a, a module called Beautiful Soup, um, and this is for parsing uh, web pages in Python. So basically I take the result um, from the article, so we take all that massive text, and I say to Python, well this is actually a HTML uh, page, uh, so let's treat it as a HTML page. So then let's say, how can we actually navigate through the text of that page? Well, let's say I'm interested in all the links that are found uh, in that article. So all the all the external websites and files, um, et cetera, that an article links to. So I can say, right, go find me all of the link tags uh, in the article uh, and show me some of them. So you can see again, we get a list of results. So we get a list of these A tags uh, and we can see the link uh, for each um, one. But let's tidy up how we actually look at it. So firstly, how many links are on this article? So this particular Guardian article has 14 links uh, on its page. Uh, and then we can look at each link um, itself. So it links to uh, its own uh, website. It links to the Johns Hopkins University. It links to another three, four, five. Yeah, the rest of the article links basically to the Guardian website. So you can see using this approach, there may be interesting questions around um, you know, do news articles tend to self-refer? Do they refer to uh, the Guardian website? Do they link to other sources of information? How many on average per article, um, et cetera? Lots of uh, interesting things we can do. Um, it's a separate topic itself, um, and we cover it in more detail um, in our previous webinar, and all the code for that as well um, is available um, online. So we've downloaded article text, um, for one particular article, let's actually save it. Much the same code again, define a file for saving it, open the file and dump the JSON data. So you can see into my downloads folder, I've saved this article um, right here. So the final thing we'll do is we will handle the rate limit. So we can do up to 5,000 per day, um, but there may be times where we're, uh, we're, in, we're at risk of breaching that limit. Now there's usually no penalty for breaching the limit. What happens is you're just um, denied requesting uh, the data. So it just says for um, the rest of the day, you just can't make any more um, requests. So you don't need to worry legally or financially really um, about requesting too much data. You'll just be prevented from doing so. So it, it is worth keeping track um, of how many um, requests you've made. So thankfully the API actually tells you how many you've made. Uh, and it stores it in an attribute called headers from the response uh, variable. So if we take a look at the headers that are returned by this response, lots of things we don't really need to know about. <clears throat> uh, but there's a couple of variables. Um, 
called X rate limit limit day 5000 so we can see that's the 5000 um, daily limit and then we can see how many are remaining today um, I've got 4900 left so I've obviously used quite a few today getting this ready some of you might have been using it at home so we're working through our 5000 um, daily limit so we've got a couple of fields in the uh, headers attribute that we might want to capture and um, so let's use some of this metadata um, to track how many uh, requests we've got left. So if we go into the headers attribute, we can take out this key. Uh, again, we can take out this one, stored in this variable. And basically, the total number of calls we made are what we're allowed request minus what's uh, remaining. And we can ask Python to say, how many calls have we made today? We have made um, 104. Let's just very quickly test it out if uh, we're working through a loop. So I'm going to say, um, yeah, let's let's boost this a little bit. Let's let's say, uh, let's not be too. Let's, uh, let's request about 49 pages. I will just ask Python at the end to spit out um, how many calls uh, we've made. So as you can see, we're asking Python to keep track um, of how many calls we're making. So you can see it's working away. It's actually requesting data from the API, and it's just keeping track. Um, oh, I might keep keep going. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah. So it's probably a little bit small, um, but we've now made 153 calls to the API um, today. So that's just maybe slightly more intermediate uh, knowledge, but it's all there in the notebook um, for when you um, need it. Perfect. So let's just take a, a quick look um, at some of the values uh, and the limitations and ethical implications. Um, hopefully, as I demonstrated, maybe the, the data structure is quite unfamiliar, but the process of requesting data from an API is well established. It's mature. There's lots of packages that are really useful. Um, it, hopefully, I'd even say within an hour, you could be using an API. Um, I, would, I would say that. Um, really critically APIs are intended to be interacted with so in comparison to scraping a website um, an API has already thought about the structure of the data it's thought about the fields that you need and um, it's it's thought about the format that it returns the data in so actually APIs um, usually provide access to data that that's at least is formatted and structured correctly even if its actual data mightn't be high quality itself that's for you um, to decide in general, APIs just store fantastically interesting information. And um, there's a company's house API where you can get pretty much all information about all UK registered companies. It's tremendously interesting, um, including disqualified board members. Very, very interesting. Um, with an API, you don't have to bulk download data. You can actually customize your request and just get back what you actually um, need. And even if you're not sold on this, which is totally fine, maybe the information you need is only available on an API and it is just worth learning these skills um, for that purpose. What would be uh, some of the limitations? Well, APIs restrict the number of requests, so 5,000 per day is pretty good, but you might envision um, a scenario where that's actually not um, suitable. Uh, so the quality of documentation can vary widely. There are some god-awful documentation that can make it incredibly difficult to request uh, data. It's actually hugely frustrating. The Guardian is excellent, thankfully, but I've used some that I won't mention that were um, uh, depressing. The data that's actually contained in APIs is still you know, um, affected by data protection laws. So if you think of the EU's uh, GDPR, um, if you're collecting data about individuals, you've got a responsibility to process that data, to only use it for the purpose um, that you've stated, to dispose of it and archive it in a proper way, um, et cetera. So just because it's data publicly available from an API uh, does not mean you don't get to think about um, data protection. And even though an API can provide free access to data, it's still a product, um, it's still has terms of use or service, basically the contract between you and the API um, associated with it. There's no need to get scared legally about that, but there may be restrictions on the use of the data available through an API or the attribution that you must give if you use the data for research purposes, um, for example. 
Uh, and then finally, APIs can be updated on a, a frequent basis. So the rate limit can change, um, whether you need to register can change, the endpoints can move and change. Uh, so if you're writing code, it does need to be periodically um, reviewed. Uh, much like what I'm doing with this, I'm going to have to check it um, on a fairly uh, regular basis. So the ethical implications, so I'm assuming most of you are, are researchers, but even if you're private sector or public sector, um, government for example, you'll still have to get clearance um, for what you're doing. So you're still going to have to think about um, researcher harm, harm to the participant, data security, curation, encryption, all these um, various things. Something that's particularly um, relevant to the use of APIs is informed um, consent. So let's take Twitter data as an example. Um, this is something we're going to actually um, provide training on over the summer, so we will use the Twitter API, but let's, let's think of Twitter data. Um, so when users sign up to Twitter, they do sign something saying, you know, Twitter can share your data with third parties, um, etc. But can that reasonably be said to have given consent to participating in your research project just because you can now access the API? And if, you, if that's not the case, so you say, okay, they have not given informed consent, how am I actually able to get it? Can I then go through the API to get the user's details and contact them one by one? It gets very, very difficult and very murky quite quickly. The API will make a lot of information available. Um, and again, you might say, well, if somebody posted something on Twitter that appears private or personal, if it's publicly available through the API, I can use it. But really, will there be bits of information that are private and personal that you really shouldn't be using for your research? Um, and are there identification risks? So usually, you know, APIs won't tell you exactly who somebody is or exactly which organization you're, you're looking at. Um, but of course, we know you can identify somebody using combinations of other variables. So maybe your research actually reveals a very vulnerable person um, on a social network that somebody else was looking for. That can be quite worrying. And then let's say you capture some personal data <clears throat> through the API, and then in a couple of months later, that individual actually thought, oh, I don't want that on my profile anymore. It was a phone number, it was, a, it was an email address. But you've already captured it you know, previously. Can you now use that in your research? Now that the user has said, um, I consider this too personal. And it is a minefield, it doesn't prevent, I mean, there's lots of great social science research using Twitter and other APIs but you have to think about these ethical um, concerns. Excellent, so there's been lots of really good questions, so I'm gonna go uh, through some of them. So thank you, obviously, firstly, um, I decided to take my time in um, response to feedback about you know, taking a bit more to go through the coding demonstration. So if you have five more minutes, um, I'm gonna work through um, uh, some of the questions. <clears throat> So this comes up uh, quite often, which is about you know Python versus Stata versus um, R versus MATLAB versus something else. I'm not going to dodge this question, um, but I'm going to say I'm quite agnostic about tools. So for me as a social scientist, I choose the tool that I think is best for a given task, but that's not a, always objective. I would like to think that particularly Python, um, what I've just shown you is English language based. It's fairly understandable. It's fairly logical. I don't think R is quite as understandable um, as Python. That's a personal um, judgment. Uh, but Python is certainly uh, more understandable and easier to read than, let's say, Julia or Perl or C Sharp or Visual Basic or lots of other programming um, languages. But ultimately, um, it's up to you. How do you normally find out uh, where the API um, is located? <clears throat> Quite simply, a, a, just a Google search. I knew the Guardian had an API, but I didn't know the web address. I just Google searched it, looked through the Guardian's website, and eventually found the documentation. Um, so there's no easy answer for that. You just have to you know, type in Google API if you want to use the Google a API, Companies House API, um, et cetera. And that's, that's linked to a question as well about how can you determine if a website uses an API. Um, essentially what I've just described of you know, doing a, a web engine search. Um, there are a couple of other ways. I might write something technical, but some web pages are actually powered by an API. So when you load a web page, it actually makes a call to an API um, 
to load in the web page and sometimes you can circumvent that web page and go directly to the API even though there's no documentation about it um, etc and um, but it's a it's not technical in terms of how you do it but how you spot the fact that the website has an API powering it and um, is a little bit tricky so I'll probably write something about that but um, it's quite difficult to describe uh, here uh, oh, this is a really good question. So somebody's research topic is about news and um, articles. What are the benefits of using an API approach rather than going to LexisNexis? Um, so I know what LexisNexis is, but I haven't used it. And so I'm kind of uh, making an assumption here. Um, but I would firstly say um, being able to write your own Python or R code or whatever you're using um, takes a little bit extra to begin with, but actually uh, brings enormous benefits in terms of flexibility, customization, and um, <clears throat> you can schedule your script to run at fixed intervals, so you're not having to manually go to ne Lexus Nexus um, itself. Um, so there are a couple of um, advantages of using a programming um, language. Uh, really good question again. Um, when connecting or scraping an API, do you need to think about permission? Um, yes. Uh, so the API documentation will clearly state you need to sign up or you don't. And if you don't need to sign up, um, you could just do the requesting like you've just seen uh, me do. So there's no providing authentication. You just say requests.get the web address um, of interest. Basically, if there's an API available and it's got documentation associated with it, it's intended to be used. Um, so maybe you have to register, but if you don't, you don't have to ask them, you don't have to let them know that, hey, I'm about to download your data. It's there to be used um, as and when uh, you need it. Um, yes, someone correctly guessed that it was Fine Ales um, based up in Scotland was the name of the brewery. Uh, well done. Are we asked to submit an ethical form to collect data from websites? Um, yes, I think if you're talking about an institution, so a university, for example, um, yeah, I mean, it's a data collection activity. It's part of your re your research project. Um, it needs ethical clearance. If you're <clears throat> collecting data from an API that doesn't have anything to do with individuals, then your ethical clearance is probably um, guaranteed, or it's you know it's going to be easier to pass. Um, but if an API has information about children or vulnerable adults or really personal data, you definitely have to um, get ethical um, approval. Uh, do you know any websites where they actively try to prevent you scraping? Um, so yes, so an API, as I said, it's, um, it's meant to be used. It, it'll only prevent you from making a certain number of requests, but you're allowed to request data. Certain websites, um, Google is certainly one. If you try to scrape the Google homepage, for example, or Google search results, uh, yeah, that will block you from scraping the web page, um, absolutely. Uh, there's a specific question about companies house um, which I'll ask you to contact me directly if that's okay because that's quite um, specific and text um, technical uh, there's some questions about extracting data from science direct um, I don't know if that has an API if it doesn't then you can potentially use web scraping um, uh, to collect that data so you could look at our previous webinar um, or send me a question um, if you want do journals tend to have APIs? Um, I would say they tend not to have, but if they do, um, or if they have web pages, which they do, um, your question is about can you extract DOI links, then yes, in theory, you absolutely could. 